All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. As a reminder for those attending virtually, questions can be posted on the Q&A throughout the lecture, and you can join us for a more informal meet and greet at the end of the presentation by asking the host to unmute you. The CME and MOC2 codes will be posted in the chat and displayed in the back of Rangos. Today is our annual Kangos Grand Rounds lecture. Jim Kangos received his undergraduate education at Bucknell University and his medical education at Rutgers Medical School and Tufts University School of Medicine. He was a resident in pediatrics from 1977 to 1980 and an outpatient chief resident the year of 1981 to 1980, I'm sorry, 1980 to 1981 at UPNC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, an institution for which he maintained deep affection Thereafter, he was engaged in the private practice of pediatrics in Connecticut until 1986, when tragically, before his 35th birthday, he passed away due to complications of ulcerative colitis. During his brief career, he championed the cause of foster children and worked effectively to reform regulations governing this disadvantaged group for whom he had a special affinity. It was Jim's wish that this annual lectureship be established at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC to stimulate future physicians to study and ultimately cure inflammatory bowel disease so that some good might come of his ordeal. He left money for this purpose, which with funds donated by his family and friends will perpetually support this worthy goal and honor the memory of a deeply missed colleague and cherished friend. And I'd like to thank his family for joining us virtually today. We would like to thank Dr. Maria Abreu for speaking with us today on this special day. Maria attended medical school at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, residency at Brigham Women's, and her gastroenterology fellowship at UCLA. She's the director of the Crohn's and Colitis Center at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where she also serves as a vice chair for research, professor of the Department of Medicine, and professor of microbiology and immunology. She completed a three-year term as chair of the International Organization for the Study of Inflammatory Bowel Disease in 2022. In 2019, she was elected um, counselor at large of the American Gastroenterological Association, or AGA, governing board for a term of three years. Most recently, she was elected vice president of the AGA and is the president-elect for 2024. She was the 2019 Sherman Prize recipient and in 2020, she received the Helio Lifetime Disruptor Award. This award goes to a gastroenterologist or hepatologist who consistently pushes the field of gastroenterology forward through innovative treatments, practice management, patient care, or research. Dr. Abreu has spent most of her academic career focused on advancing IBD research with an emphasis on identifying novel therapeutic targets for those living with IBD. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Abreu. Hi, Dr. Sinteri, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry not to be there in person. Um, I'll begin by hopefully someone will put in the chat if you're hearing the like uh, ambient noise since um, since the moment I logged on, um, the, the gardeners started working next door. So uh, please uh, don't be shy and let me know. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, when I heard um, that this was a, a lecture in, in memory of someone, you know, of a, of a physician who, who passed away um, from ulcerative colitis or complications of ulcerative colitis. I, I was very sad and, and felt and feel, and hopefully by the end of this conversation with you today, that um, you'll see that thankfully this is something that is, is not, uh, um, is not uh, happening anymore. Uh, because of the advances in therapies that we've made. These are my disclosures. Hopefully these are publicly available. Um, I, so I, I know I'm speaking to, um, to an audience of, 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 of pediatricians more generally in different specialties. Uh, I'll remind you that, that, that inflammatory bowel disease uh, comes in two general flavors. We talk about Crohn's disease um, and Crohn's disease being a disease that can affect any part of the GI tract. It's patchy. It, it can uh, have complications that relate to the fact that, that you can have narrowing of the small intestine, narrowing of the colon too as well, but you know, statistically far more often in the small intestine requiring surgery to remove a segment of bowel because patients are obstructed or the intestine can perforate into another loop of bowel or in the perianal area. When there's a perforation into another loop of bowel, I often use the analogy that's like ways with a Z, that it's trying to find 
a, a, a way to bypass the, the, the obstruction. I'm not, in my time, the time I visited Pittsburgh, um, I actually thought Pittsburgh was a super cool town. Um, I, I was in some traffic, but not the amount of traffic that we have in Miami where you really absolutely need ways. Oh, I skipped this one. So this is ulcerative colitis, the, the disease uh, that Dr. Kangos had um, that I describe as, as taking sandpaper to the lining of the colon um, and really getting rid of the mucosa of the colon. And in very severe cases, when we scope these patients, you can actually see the muscularis. There's no mucosa left because of that. Um, and now in the era that people are doing ultrasound or MRIs, you can see that the fat surrounding the, the, the colon is also reacting to that inflammation. I only mention that because this notion that it's only mucosal needs to be uh, rethought a bit. Um, this tells you a little bit about the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, whenever you see something like as complicated as, as this, you, you know that we like have no idea. I'm exaggerating, of course, we have some idea, but what you can see on, on, on this, uh, on this uh, graphic, and I, I'm putting my laser pointer on just to be, just to be cool, is that in, 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 in health, we have a very diverse microbiome. I think it's sort of also um, a comment on society that a more, a, a more diverse um, uh, habitat is better for everyone. And this, uh, and we have a healthy um, uh, epithelial barrier um, that where this, where there's a continuous layer of cells that separates us from that internal world of the, of, in this case, the intestinal lumen with all this uh, bacteria living in it. And juxtaposed is the mucosal immune system with, uh, that orchestrates um, uh, an immune response that's meant to be dire directed at pathogens is probably important at clearing or taking up bacteria that make it across that epithelial barrier and not having a big inflammatory response against it. But obviously all these things are deranged in patients that have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and shown here are various ways, various aspects of that immune response that we try to target in therapy for the disease. Um, so there's a genetic susceptibility. Patients that have inflammatory bowel disease um, often have relatives that have it, first degree and second degree relatives that have it. But, we're, but I'm gonna talk to you later about some of the work that we're doing in Miami and not surprisingly in immigrant populations, often these are the first people in a family that, that have IBD. Uh, there are many different things that have been implicated as, as triggers for inflammatory bowel disease. It, it's not only genetic susceptibility uh, because um, I, again, I'm speaking to pediatricians in the world of pediatric IBD, there's a subset of patients that have very early onset IBD that's almost like an autosomal dominant uh, condition. But in but broadly, probably the majority, even in children who develop IBD, they have a complex genetic disorder that has many different genes and that the genes alone are not sufficient to develop IBD. And probably the main ingredient that is required to be uh, cooperating or complicit in the development of IBD is the microbiome. And so the search has been on for some time to understand what is abnormal about the microbiome in a patient with IBD and how can we restore that to health? And then, the, and then if we restore that to health, would that uh, lead to resolution of the inflammation? Uh, again, in this world, in this sub, sub world that I live in of inflammatory bowel disease that of course spans uh, adult and, and pediatric uh, worlds, I think we've made great advances in genetics of IBD and I'll mention a few of those. Uh, of course, the microbiome. Uh, now everyone's a Johnny come lately and in the audience, uh, whether virtual or in person, there are people that are studying the microbiome and uh, you know, diabetes and the microbiome and metabolic syndrome and in NAFLD and in, in a, a variety of in, in depression. But in reality, the party started with IBD and gastroenterology and GI related diseases and trying to understand that very direct uh, impact of the microbiome on these diseases. There's because um, there's a chicken and egg problem that occurs in IBD. We, we know that the microbiome is dysbiotic in these patients, but we don't, um, we don't know, did that occur first or did that come later? And so different groups um, are, have been doing studies to see if they could identify even before the onset of IBD, 
whether there are changes in the microbiome. And in some cases there are. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about some diet intervention studies that we're doing. And I think now um, that's coming into its own is, right, is doing larger scale diet intervention studies to understand what people should eat, whether that has an impact on inflammation or not. And then um, single cell technologies, you know, I, I was at a science meeting this summer uh, that, that I helped to organize um, that was on GI science broadly. And my joke was you couldn't give a talk unless you had a, uh, uh, unless you had a, um, a uh, single cell, you know, um, slide uh, using single cell technology to look at the, the, ex the expression of genes like at the RNA level in clusters of cells within whatever you're studying. But of course, in this case, it's germane to the GI tract, which is a, which is a very interesting and complicated organ. organ. Okay, this tells you a little bit about the, the genetics of IBD and, and this in this most recent um, analysis where they pooled, imagine greater, uh, more than 100,000 individuals have been sequenced with IBD across the world, but mostly European populations. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, a couple of interesting themes emerged. The first is that, although I showed you these pictures that looked very disparate of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, in reality, uh, these are very related disorders and the overwhelming majority of the genes are common between these two disorders. And these are genes that are involved with our relationship to the external world. It's controlling in, you know, infection, controlling inflammation and barrier function type genes. And then some of the genes that are, seem to be more specific to ulcerative colitis or to Crohn's disease are probably the genes that direct a lot of the phenotypic expressions of, of the disease, NOD2 being classically associated with ileal Crohn's disease um, and MHC uh, genes more associated with ulcerative colitis. Oh, I meant to hide this. I think uh, uh, I'll just share with you. It's just that I, I had given a talk at, at Cedar sinai that um, where I described that, that like a thousand years ago in another lifetime when I was young and I didn't have gray hair, um, we did a study at Cedar sinai describing that people with NOD2 mutations had, um, had stricture and complications, and that has held up the, 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 the test of time. Um, uh, so anyway, I'm talking to you from Miami. Um, in fact, I'm embarrassed to tell you that the pool guy just came, but generally that's not a noise-making thing, but don't be not a stranger in the, not a complete stranger in the backyard. And, and Miami, I describe as the capital of Latin America. And, uh, and when I moved here, I was struck by the number of patients that I was seeing that, had, that didn't know how to spell Crohn's disease, had never heard of this, and all these patients were developing IBD. Um, so we, we all, but this is Latin America coming to Miami. We know that in Latin America and other newly industrialized countries in Asia, the, the, the incidence of IBD is rapidly rising. And you can see, for example, in Brazil, an 11% in increase in the incidence of, of, of IBD over time and in ulcerative colitis. And these are, and, and, and actually I think this is true in all of Latin America, uh, but they don't have good epidemiological data. So this is happening in, as we, uh, I mean, I could say we export McDonald's, but there are lots of changes that come, that come along for the ride. And so this led us here in Miami to, to ask the question, can we study immigrants to understand the causes of IBD? And, uh, and very recently, um, we, we became part of this uh, consortium called the NIDDK consortium, that uh, genetics consortium that, that is, is meant to study the genetics of IBD here in this country. But in this last round of funding, they decided that they really wanted non-European ancestry populations, because again, as I showed you, um, they've sequenced 100,000 people that are of European descent. And the question is, 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 that, is that data applicable to, um, to, to people broadly? Um, this shows you kind of the spread of the countries represented in our, uh, in our IBD clinic and in our IBD biobank in Miami. And uh, these are all self-identified people as self-identified Hispanics. Um, I'll call your attention to the fact that 40% are, it says USA, and that means that they're American born, but of parents that are, his, are both Hispanic, that's how we've defined it. 
not just one parent Hispanic. And this would be someone like, like me, I'm American born, but my parents were born in Cuba. And then you can see that the, the next most common group are Cubans um, that, that are in our biobank in Colombia. But what I find interesting is this doesn't exactly mimic uh, the demographic of Miami where you know, we have more Colombians than that. We now have a lot of Venezuelans, but I've seen an uptick in our clinic of people from Venezuela now coming and developing IBD. So there, it, requ it requires like a certain amount of time in the United States before this unfolds. Um, this is relatively recent uh, data. We have uh, you know, now about 3,300 people that have generously consented to participate in our studies um, and we collect on all of these patients' DNA, we collect uh, a PAX gene, RNA tube on all of them. We have serum on all of them. And if they're undergoing uh, a colonoscopy, the consent allows us to collect tissue if they allow us, you know, from, and we do it in a, in a protocolized way from ileum, from ascending colon. And if they have ulcerative colitis, we collect sigmoid colon and we collect uh, what we call stool washes, because I'm not sure we, 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 we know. Sometimes it's stool if they're not well prepped and sometimes it's really kind of water. So that gives you an idea of our, of our collection. And not quite half of those patients are Hispanic patients, which makes for a very large collection of Hispanic patients in a single center. My colleague, Ariana Damas, who has a passion for this, um, for, for this notion of what, what is driving IBD in Hispanic populations as a medical student here, um, and now she's uh, you know, trying to become an associate professor, how time flies. Um, describe this uh, older paper. And I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, in, in many studies, when you pick up a journal, they, they, they separate people into Hispanics or say non-Hispanic whites. But there's another layer of complexity, which is, is someone born in, a, in, in their country of origin and, and emigrated to the United States or are they American born of you know, brought their genes, but now, you know, uh, Cuban parts built in the USA or whatever the variation is. And what she found was that, oh, I apologize. What she found was that if you just said Hispanics and non-Hispanics, you don't see much of a difference. But if you separated by those that are born in another country versus US born, she found that there were, that patients that were born in, uh, you know, in, in outside of the US that are Hispanic developed IBD at a later age, so you can see the mean age is, is, is older, it was significantly older, and they tended to develop more ulcerative colitis. I think that's changing a bit. Um, and so she did a subsequent study where, she, this is Oriana, and this is Alejandro Quintero, my research coordinator, our lead research coordinator. And this is before I was blonde. I've only been blonde for a little while. Um, but this, make, this picture always makes me happy because we went to Cuba thinking that we would be able to try to study this in Cuba, like the origin of, what's changing in the Cuban environment, perhaps that might be increasing IBD, um, but that, um, that was difficult. And we can talk about that maybe in the, in the Q&A. So what she described is that, that patients, um, that, that we, she divided the groups of Cuban immigrants into three buckets. Those that came before 1980, those that came after 1980, which is the Mario boat lift, but before 1980 is when Fidel took over and, and there was a, a big exodus uh, in the 1960s, for example, of my parents' generation of Cubans. Then in 1980, there was the Mario boat lift. And then in the 90s, the Soviet Union pulled out support for, for, for the Cuban government. And when the Soviet Union stopped supporting the Cuban government, people like were going hungry and literally you know, making rafts and coming to the United States. And so what she found was there wasn't much of a difference in the patients that developed IBD in terms of how old they were when they got to the United States and all this stuff. But what, what changed very abruptly is the amount of time they needed to be in the United States before they presented with IBD. Hopefully I've explained that in a way that's understandable. So whereas before 1980, these people, my, you know, Cuban immigrants that came in the 60s, it took a mean of 30 years before they developed IBD in this country, now it's down to eight years. So something about the environment here receiving them or wherever, the, or maybe when they left Cuba is changing and changing rapidly. And I think that time is getting shorter. And although we focused on Cubans because we thought it was a natural, interesting experiment of a population trapped on an island, not really having a lot of 
exchange of genetic material, uh, we saw the same trend for uh, all Hispanic groups here that we take care of. She then at that juncture uh, looked at, at uh, a genetic risk score and, these, and, and this is 2017. So not all the different polymorphisms that we now know are related to IBD are on a, were on this chip because we used a chip-based approach, which was, which, was the, which was the style, which was the style then. But this is only to make the point that at least in terms of overall genetic risk, um, Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites look really very similar. So, so it's not really about, uh, it, at, of the known genes, that Hispanic people have a difference in the, the load of genes, right? It, it, they're not protected in that way. It's obvious that there's a contribution of the environment that in, in Latin America is protecting them. I, I, in other words, um, they're developing IBD here, um, and, but genetically they're very similar to the population here. Um, so now that we have like really kind of more resources and uh, are collaborating with more groups uh, within this IBD Genetics Consortium, we have a very nice collaboration with my uh, my old uh, home at Cedar sinai with Dermot McGovern and his talented group of people. And we have combined our data on, on uh, whole genome sequencing of Hispanic patients that we take care of, that they take, that they have in their biobank, and that, and that some, uh, and a chunk of which came from Puerto Rico. And and I wanna to try to show you what this slide means. Um, it used to be that in genetics, we wanted to have uh, very matched populations that we took spousal controls so that we could match them ancestrally. Of course, you can see that that really doesn't always work out. And we, we, we shouldn't be talking, uh, I, I, mean, I know that you're a sophisticated audience about race, which is a, a social concept, but really about ancestry. And genetically, we can tell someone's ancestry. And the, mo the most complex genetics are from people from Africa, right there, that's where humanity started. And so what you can see here is that if you look at the population, it doesn't matter whether you look at the controls or the cases, because it's the same, that at theaters, uh, a, there's a bigger proportion of, of, and, of, of the IBD patients and of the controls whose ancestry is Native American. And Native American means Amerindian. These are people that came across the Bering Straits. And uh, so there's a, some relationship to Asian genes, but these are Amerindian genes. So these are um, uh, maybe not surprisingly, um, they didn't get as diluted by European genes and, uh, and, and represent a lot of, of say Central America. Um, as distinct from uh, the Puerto Rican patient, and, and controls where you can see that they, they have a higher proportion ancestrally of African genes. And then here we are in Miami, uh, in the, in, which has the highest proportion of European genes. And that all has to do with the, the countries that they came from in Latin America and um, how effective the European diseases were at wiping out the native population. But what's interesting is, and what I, what I, what I feel validates the notion that we should be studying non-European populations and that this focus that the NIH has, has on this is that for, for the genes that are in, in these different uh, colors, you know, in the, in, the, in the yellow or the blue or purple, these are genes where the effect of the gene, this polymorphism is either, ha has a significantly different risk uh, in our Hispanic patients. Um, so, so for example, I'll, I'll just draw your attention to something like uh, this IL-18 or IL-23, that in this case, the, um, the risk is even higher in this population of patients than in the comparator group, which, which are these, um, the, the control group. Um, and, and we focused some attention on this leucine-rich repeat, like LRRK2 gene, this is a gene that's been implicated in Parkinson's disease and is, kind of, is, is an interesting gene in and of itself. And what they were, what our geneticists were able to model was they said, okay, we're gonna pretend that we have a, um, a you know, an almost pure uh, non amerindian indian population. So this is mostly European and African versus those, those patients that are um, 
purely, um, almost purely, Amero Indian uh, uh, in their in their ancestry, and you can see that the the odds ratio. Um, whereas if you're if you're not if you're you know more European or African, the odds ratio if you've got like a, like you you know have this particular polymorphism on both you know both alleles are this particular polymorphism, the risk is like four times higher that you're going to have IBD, Crohn's disease in particular. Whereas if you're a Mara Indian and you have that like that double whammy, in fact it's protective and it's even more protective when you have the double whammy. So that's kind of interesting, right? It tells you that that it the gene is important, but it has an opposite effect. And we're gonna try to figure out why is that opposite effect. Okay, so that was genetics. Um, you know, some of you in the audience are, are gastroenterologists and, 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 and some of you are IBD experts, um, but our world of IBD has, has really evolved very abruptly. You can see these are the different medications that we use. And this slide, like, I don't know what I'm gonna do uh, graphically because I'm running out of space. And, and in 2022, we had two almost simultaneous uh, drugs approved, one for Crohn's disease, one for ulcerative colitis, which I think actually are important uh, additions to our, to our armamentarium. So this is changing very rapidly. But it also begs the question, I now, um, because I, I do clinical work and I, have, I do basic science work, I'm often asked, to evaluate, like uh, there's a new compound, it has these characteristics, do you think it should be tested? And the issue is that we test many of these compounds in animal models and, you know, animal models probably in any of the diseases that you're interested in are not terribly, are, because we're talking about mouse models, we're not really talking about large animals, right? Um, so we're very far away from what is actually happening in, in a large mammal when we start to, when we test little mice, right? And I think that this could have led us astray. Um, but we also don't have good biomarkers. We can say we gave someone a medication, we gave an IBD patient this medication, and we have a rapid readout. Rather than do like a 300 person study or larger, we have a rapid readout that this, this medication could work, right? And that's what we need. So um, this shows you in the like a little bit like taking that same pathogenesis slide that I showed you before and showing you different players in the in the in 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 inflammation as well as um, how we're targeting it right so you can see that uh, we've had anti tnf therapy for a long time that's being produced by activated macrophages to some extent by dendritic cells and to uh, like smaller numerical extent by t cells um, il23 is being is being produced by uh, dendritic cells and that very much can shape the immune response and lead to generation of Th17 cells, which we believe are, are very pro-inflammatory. And now we have a whole cascade of like different anti-IL-23 agents. Um, JAK inhibitors work by a different way. And, and uh, uh, in, the, in the Lego pieces of immunology, um, JAKs are enzymes that link a cytokine receptor to signaling inside of a cell and, there, and companies have made small molecules that can inhibit the, generally the kinase domain to block that signal. So for example, if you're, you know, um, uh, interferon gamma works this way, right? So if this, the, uh, you can make goobs and gobs of interferon gamma, but if the receptor can't send a message to the cell saying, do something with this information, it, it, can, it goes nowhere. Um, and we have other strategies that we use to treat the disease. Um, so, but, you know, again, there might have been a lot of other compounds that weren't tested in the right population or never saw the light of day because they didn't work in a mouse. The other aspect of things that that that, that I wanted to draw your attention to, uh, and that I you know that I take very seriously, is the idea that we have very underrepresented uh, populations of Americans in clinical trials. Not, you know, we have very underrepresented Hispanics and African Americans in clinical trials of IBD. But it's it's even worse than that. We have very few Americans in clinical trials of IBD because we have often access to medication. The, the way these clinical trials are designed are very uh, uh, onerous. Uh, I don't know if that's the best word, but they, um, it, of course it's placebo controlled. 
we can discuss in, in the world of pediatrics, you, you and the composite have pushed back on placebo controlled studies because um, I'm, I'm not an ethicist. I, I'm not sure that it's unethical, but if you compound the fact that it's placebo controlled and that they have a long uh, washout period. So now you've washed them out for months to get them into the study and you've given them a placebo. I think that's unethical, right? So we're, we're really trying to understand how we can make this better and, and of course, hopefully uh, improve the uh, enrollment of, of other um, underrepresented populations so that we can actually be able to confidently uh, know that these drugs work. And that goes back to this, this thing I told you, this long story I told you about the genetics. It's not a trivial question, right? There, there could very well be differences in how patients respond to these different therapies. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this for, for time's sake. Um, we now have set a standard for ourselves in the world of IBD where we want, maybe in the, in the era, you know, in the 80s and, 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 and so forth, we expected just people to feel better. And that's great. We still expect people to feel better. But now, you know, we're endoscopists. Um, uh, after infliximab, we started looking at the mucosa and seeing if it's healed and, and realized, oh, we've got drugs that will heal ulcers. It didn't used to be that way, by the way. So um, they really set a new standard for what we expect our medications to do. Um, the future is gonna be, um, I think biomarkers, I'm gonna get to that in a second, but I think the, the other future is gonna be combining therapies. This is a study, I don't think it's been published unless it's been published in the last two weeks. It's only an abstract form where um, it's done in ulcerative colitis, but it's, I think this is applicable to Crohn's and, and the clinical trials are gonna be happening at a larger scale for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis where um, this particular company combined uh, an anti-TNF with an anti-P19, in other words, anti-IL-23, and the two together did better than either alone, not synergistic, but at least additive. That's particularly true if you look at, this is response on the right, by the way, clinical remission, which is a higher bar. Again, you can see a clear uh, win when you combine the two. The devil in the details, of course, is that something like golimumab, which is an anti-TNF, a subcutaneous anti-TNF, is like not necessarily our go-to anti-TNF, which I think is probably still for most people in fliximab, but nevertheless, it tells you that the that the concept that the, that the two combined actually have a better response, and that was true for endoscopy as well. Um, the other things that that happened once we the the other I think things that we need to take into account when we take care of IBD patients is that this is a systemic disease, and when we had only anti-TNFs. Um, we saw, okay, they got some, most, many, got better uh, from their luminal disease, but it also had a terrific impact on a lot of the extraintestinal manifestations that, that come along with IBD, like, like ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthropathies, perianal fistulizing disease, uh, you know, the rashes, pyoderma, erythema nodosum, arthritis. Um, the psoriaform reaction is really kind of a consequence of being on anti-TNF therapy. But the point is that often these patients will not necessarily complain unless you ask them about these extra intestinal manifestations. And some of the medications we use are better at treating some of these extra intestinal manifestations um, and, and not just the luminal disease. And so hopefully, again, as I said, we could get be better at individualizing therapy for patients using biomarkers. So can we do a better job choosing the right therapy for the, for the right patient? And so um, we've tried to address this in my lab. Um, uh, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I like to say all Cubans are conspiracy theorists, but I think in the composite, in all these clinical trials that have been done that have collected biopsy material, I bet that there's a better answer for, you know, which biomarkers uh, can predict uh, who's gonna respond to therapy, but that's a sidebar. Um, what we've, what we've tried to do is we've taken biopsies. Remember I told you we, we, we do biopsies. And in this case, we take the biopsies and we like, um, you know, kind of uh, prepare single cells from those biopsies. And once we do that, we isolate just uh, immune cells respond that, that are phagocytic, right? So uh, mostly dendritic cells, macrophages and, and neutrophils that are phagocytic. And my um, uh, MD PhD student, Jillian Jacobson, then uh, submitted these cells, which are, you know, which is, uh, which are kind of a subset of all the cells and did RNA sequencing. 
and I just want to draw your attention to, to two things. Uh, the biggest difference actually when you do RNA sequencing and say, okay, computer, tell us, uh, separate the, like, the most disparate gene expression patterns. And when the computer did that, and this is principal component analysis, uh, it separated the ileal biopsies from the colonic biopsies. So even though we isolated cells that looked the same, right? They had the same markers on their surface. In reality, uh, they at a, at a gene expression levels, the location is everything. So location is very, you know, the, the gene expression and location had more, was more important than if it was Crohn's versus UC or whether it was inflamed or uninflamed. So look, so these cells are different when they come from colon or when they come from ileum. And, and I think that the genetics tells us that ileal Crohn's disease lives kind of in a separate from colonic Crohn's disease than ulcerative colitis. So this is not, uh, this kind of like in hindsight, okay, maybe that's not so surprising. The other kind of subplot is that we now in, in doing subgroup analysis, see that in most clinical trials, um, ileal disease takes longer to heal or is more difficult to heal than colonic disease. Okay, so there's that. Then um, she found, you know, that, that the, the, the sort of the biggest difference in gene expression when you get down one lower, one level lower is when you have someone on an anti-TNF and they're not responding, they've lost response or never responded. And those, and there's a lot of, a lot of different genes are expressed in that concept, in that context. And if you look at those genes, um, uh, I think that there should be better ways to target, for example, that, you know, I put an arrow on STAT3 pathway because many of our new therapies are directed at STAT3. I'm going to skip that. Okay. Uh, I think we're still okay for time. I, 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 I said to Dr. Uh, Spears that I would stop at, uh, you know, 10 minutes up so that I can give you time for questions. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the microbiome and um, what we know and a, a lot that we don't know. And so I mentioned to you this chicken and egg phenomenon, which comes first. Um, we know that people from the moment they start having symptoms and have inflammation present, uh, they're, um, they, have, uh, they have dysbiosis. We also know that any treatment that makes the colonic or that makes their IBD better, whether it's anti-TNF or exclusive eventual nutrition that is more in the, in the wheelhouse of, of pedi pediatricians, that the microbiome starts to normalize it never really becomes the same. Um, we've spent a lot of energy sequencing microbiota. Now the next energy is being spent to look at the metabolites and the proteins being made by these bacteria, which are probably the ones that are actually doing the work, right? It's not like who's there, maybe, maybe it is somewhat who's there, but also what are they making or not making? that is contributing to IBD. And you can see that many things are down, mostly down in patients with IBD. They have less diversity um, than a patient that's healthy. Their bile acid metabolism is abnormal. Their short chain fatty acid production is abnormal. Um, so again, uh, using that same approach that I mentioned, Jillian is also now looking to see, can she sequence these cells and identify pathogens living inside the um, the phagocytic cells in the mucosa of IBD patients. And uh, we have an earlier study that suggests that in fact, the, um, the microbiome associated with these phagocytic cells is very distinct from the microbiome in the lumen of the, of, of the GI tract. I, I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but with Jillian, this is like a very, um, premature to show this, right? But, it, but it's, it's been, a, it, actually a very big methodologic challenge. Um, I, I'm not I, really, it's too early. You may not have had enough coffee for me to tell you the whole story, but suffice it to say that using this unbiased approach where she's sequencing every gene expressed in these cells, 99.9% .9 of which are mammalian genes and only a tiny percentage are bacterial genes. She's found uh, uh, the sequences associated with bacteria like Klebsiella pneumonia or adherent invasive E. coli that might very well be playing a role in IBD. So it's our belief that these approaches could lead to identification of novel pathogens. Okay, so now we have a couple of minutes, I hope, for me to talk about, about diet, right? And, and the segue is, okay, um, 
eventually, uh, very, I hope soon, we're gonna be using microbiome-based approaches, right? Giving back microbiota um, of note, uh, the first FDA approved treatment of, of kind of a microbiota-based treatment has recently been approved for C. diff. It's called, uh, it's a, a, a cocktail that has to be given as an enema. So for recurrent, to prevent recurrence of C. diff is, the, is, the, is their marketing plan. Um, but, but there isn't a patient that walks into my office that doesn't ask the question, what should I eat? Or goes into a whole like narrative about what they are eating, right? What they are eating. And they, they, expect, they expect us to have a, an intelligent comment. And diet, I think, has, has a variety of effects on IBD. Uh, one is that food can have a direct effect on inflammation. Celiac disease is the classic example, of course, of that phenomenon. Um, but in animal studies where they've done germ-free mice, uh, different, different diets could actually lead to more or less inflammation. There's obviously the effect of diet on the microbiome. So you're feeding and providing substrates to the microbiome and the metabolome and the generation of metabolites. And then finally, I'll call your attention to the fact that a lot of stuff is coming along for the ride. I think I have a couple of examples of that in, in the slides I left behind. Um, uh, I mentioned to you that, you know, I, we sort of got into diet because we figured that was the most obvious change that had abruptly occurred in these immigrants and perhaps why they are developing IBD so quickly. You can see this is a study that has nothing to do with IBD. These are not IBD patients. It's not Cuba, it's not, but it's a study of immigrants. And in this case, it's a study of a population of people of, of, Hmong, of a Hmong tribe in Thailand where investigators studied their microbiome pre-immigration. You can see a lot of diversity in their microbiome. And then they arrived at LAX. And before they left LAX, they're already losing microbial diversity and becoming and having an increase in their BMI and et cetera. And by, you know, by, by sort of one generation into this, into living here, you can see that they are, they have obesity and they basically look like um, European Americans. And so the, the changes are, occur very abruptly because as a pediatric audience, uh, I wanted to share with you that, uh, very interestingly, this change is occurring even in utero for our IBD patients. Um, uh, women with Crohn's disease are more likely to pass on the disease to their children than men who have Crohn's disease. Um, I'm sure you're thinking that's because you never know who the father is, but beyond that, it also could be a microbiome thing. And in this study that was, was done at Mount Sinai in New York, they looked at the uh, microbiome of the meconium in uh, babies born to mothers uh, with Crohn's versus babies born to mothers that did not have Crohn's disease. And um, this shows you uh, in this like principal component that the, the infants born from mothers with IBD, you can see separate in terms of their microbiota from, the, uh, from uh, babies born to women that are, that are healthy. So even the meconium is different in, in that's passed on uh, you know, i.e. in utero to um, these uh, to babies born of these mothers. And, uh, and interestingly, the fecal calprotectin, although it's not in the abnormal range, is higher in, in the babies born to mothers with IBD. It's crazy, isn't it? I think it's crazy. Um, some, these are some of the epidemiological risk factors that have been linked to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Uh, I could probably say this is cancer. Or I could probably say this is metabolic syndrome. It's all the usual suspects of eating a lot of animal fat, uh, eating a lot of, um, uh, of, uh, of processed foods and, and so forth. Um, so this is a, a relatively recently published study um, that links uh, highly processed foods uh, to developing IBD. And, it, and it, you can see the, the uh, hazard ratio of 1.7 uh, for, for Crohn's disease. It didn't quite show the same effect in ulcerative colitis, but I suspect it it's just a, 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 an error. I think it's, it's the nurse's health study in there. It's a tricky cohort of, of people. Um, high fructose, uh, high fructose corn syrup. That's in absolutely everything that we buy, um, almost everything that we buy and that patients buy. Uh, in a study um, uh, that's both uh, mouse and human, you can see that in mice, they gave these mice a high fructose 
diet versus a high glucose diet. That's the right control, right? I mean, you match the sugar amount, but in this case with glucose versus fructose, and you can see that the um, inflammation, these are inflammation scores, were higher in the ones that got high, fru high fructose. And it was mediated by the microbiome since you lost that phenomenon when they were germ-free. Um, so we've done our own studies to see if we could manipulate diet to make people better. This is a, an earlier study that we published um, in 2020 that looked at feeding ulcerative colitis patients either a, a low-fat, high-fiber diet or a standard American diet, otherwise known as SAD. Uh, the reason we had to add the I uh, in the paper is because it turns out that it was kind of better than the standard American diet or certainly better than what the patients were eating. So we called it an idealized standard American diet. And we made the cover of CGH. And um, I wanna call your attention to a few things about this ulcerative colitis diet. Um, first of all, uh, it, by design, the total fat intake was significantly lower, very, very low, like 10%, which is a very hard a very hard bar. I had oat milk in my coffee this morning and I'm probably, I don't know if I'm over it. I hope I'm not over it. But my point is that there's a lot of fat and even a little fat goes a long way. So this is quite a quite draconian diet, but we've catered these meals. I should have said that. We catered these meals and therefore uh, um, it this, we had a very high rate of adherence. So, you know, I don't, it's very hard to, to do this sort of uh, uh, if you just cook for yourself. And then uh, the total fiber intake at baseline was very low. So again, um, we, uh, in the, even though we tried to give them a standard American diet, we gave them a diet that was healthier than, their, than the patient's baseline diet. So even our kind of our like um, control diet, if you will, the placebo diet was healthier than what they were eating at baseline. And then look at this. This is the thing that I always call attention for if there's any clinician in the audience. Our ulcerative colitis patients, even when they're healthy, they stop eating fruits and vegetables. And I think that's our doing, partially our doing. Uh, some of it could be this study that was published in Gastro recently that, that they might not be able to metabolize certain fibers, but I'm not sure about the chicken and egg. I think you stop eating fiber, you lose some of that um, ability. Anyway, so that's that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip this. Um, we had some improvements in inflammation with the low fat diet. Uh, we had some improvements in the microbiota, but I'd say uh, really uh, marginal. And we, um, we, we did have changes in metabolite. So now we're have embarked on a kind of a longer term study in Crohn's disease that incorporates that same diet that I showed you, but that, that combines it with in a, with psychological behavioral psychology principles to see if we can change people's diet behavior. Because yes, we can cater it for eight weeks, um, but we can't cater it indefinitely. Although as a side note, some of our drugs, uh, a couple of doses of the drugs would pay for a year of catering, no problem. Uh, they are so expensive. So that, that tells you some of the irony of our healthcare system. So we're doing a, we're doing a very interesting study. I think it's interesting. Um, where we're comparing three groups of Crohn's patients. Uh, one, uh, one, the first group only gets one-time dietary counseling. Um, the second group gets fed for eight weeks um, and, and that's that. And then the third group, the patient and a member of their household with whom they share meals gets, receives catered food and also receives the, the behavioral intervention. Um, this kind of tries to show it diagrammatically that we cater the food for the first eight weeks, but we follow them through 36 weeks. And that's what the food looks like. And we're we have a very kind of dense collection of, of, of samples that I hope will be a treasure trove for a long time to come. Uh, stool samples at various, at three different time points, urine for metabolite at three different time points, et cetera. Um, I wanna just show you the following, which is that so far, even in this eight week study, the patients that are receiving the dietary counseling, which is this kind of beigey one, right? Uh, at week eight, even though we gave them, which is what everyone does, right? You, you give people like one-time dietary counseling because they came to your office at one time. Um, you can see that we, didn't, we don't move the needle at all. Now this, this doesn't count because we're, we're still at this phase catering the meals, but nevertheless, you can see that difference. Okay. Um, 
All right, so now we're, we're, we've embarked on, can we see functional changes in, in the microbiome with this diet change? Um, I think I'm gonna skip these because I'm gonna, I see that there are questions in the chat and I'll, I'll come to this sort of overarching slide to tell you, I think that um, the only way we're gonna make real progress in IBD and, and maybe eventually cure it or at least um, have strategies for long-term remission has to depend on uh, not just uh, inhibiting the immune response as we have been doing, but also taking into account the epithelial barrier defects that occur in these patients, as well as of course the microbiome and its and its byproducts in, in having lasting change. Um, hopefully many of you, maybe not all, are awake. This is my the lab and uh, the wonderful people that I work with that, that make the magic happen. And um, as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm very involved in the AGA, hopefully all, you know, for the GI people in the audience, you're all members. And this is my uh, Instagram and, and Twitter handle. And I will stop sharing my screen.